A week ago Sunday, I was uh, at the Silver Jubilee celebration of Still Mind Zendo uh, in Chelsea, uh, uh, run by uh, uh, the Abels, uh, Janet and Greg. Uh, uh, Janet uh, was the third uh, successor of Roshi Kennedy after the Burkses, a couple in Virginia, uh, back in, I think, around 2000. And then uh, her husband, Greg, uh, became the sensei in 2006. Now they're both Roshis. Um, and I sat with them for the first eight years uh, when I came back to the city and, and their first eight years, 94 to 2002. Uh, so we, uh, it was a very good uh, reunion. Um, but one of the features, they had a string, a string trio there. One of the members is, is, a, is a, in that um, uh, group. Uh, but they also had a fascinating uh, artist, uh, Thomas Yuraku Hak, uh, who was playing the shakuhachi. How many of you have ever heard of that? Oh, great. I hadn't. Uh, so it's a, a bamboo, a Zen bamboo, f Chinese bamboo flute. Uh, shakuhachi actually, as I understand, refers to the measurements of it. It's, a, it's about 54 centimeters, so foot and a half, 20 inches long, and it's got four holes on the top and one on the bottom. So not a conventional flute, bamboo flute. Um, and you play it by breathing over the, this top, and you can, the holes are large enough that you can, you can, uh, you can hold them one third, two thirds. So it's really, really complicated and, and, and it's, it's expressive. Um, and it, I discovered that uh, this, this particular person has been doing it for 15 years. And the, uh, it goes back to the Fuku, Fuke sect of Zen monks in the Tang dynasty, so seventh, eighth century. And their way was to become enlightened through playing the flute. And why not? There are many musicians in the world who presumably, hopefully, become enlightened by being musicians and everyone doing what they're doing. Uh, but uh, it's uh, an effective way. It's kind of like a co co compilation or, or a co coming together of the energies of the universe. But this is in a very uh, intense and focused way. Um, so this is a quite a venerable tradition. Um, uh, he played two pieces and it was really hypnotic. I mean, it really drew you, you really felt that it drew you into a tremendous depth you know, right away. I certainly felt that. Um, the Mukaji is one of the most famous solo pieces that he played. It's called, Mukaji means fog, sea, and flute. Uh, said that the piece was composed 700 years ago by the monk Kichiku, who dreamed, it's always a dream, right? Who dreamed he was on a small boat in the open sea in the middle of a thick white fog. Aren't we all? And that's what life is, a little boat on the broad sea with a thick white fog. Mm -hmm. And while on the boat, he heard this music, as we should, if we're listening, music of the spheres or whatever the ancients called it. And then he composed this piece. And it was really haunting melodies. And, um, Second one that he played was about five, 400 years old. And the piece compares the nature of people and clouds. It is said that the alternating movement and stillness of clouds are truly in the spirit of nature. So too should people imitate the clouds and know when it's time to move and when it's time to be still. So you can get a lesson from just looking at the clouds. And of course, this ev the music evokes that as well. You know how clouds, especially on a summer's, summer's day, they seem to appear and disappear? Like they dissipate the water vapor, just kind of comes out of the nothingness and then back into the nothingness and it takes shape for a brief moment. Well, that's us too, <laughs> uh, our whole lives. But in fact, every moment of our lives, it's well, as it says, people are know when to be still and, and when to move. And if you're doing it right, then the movement is still. And the stillness is movement. 
so th there's a lot of a lot of uh, depth here. Uh, the uh, program says the secret of the way of shakuhachi is it's like seeing all of life in a single stem of a flower. It reminds you, uh, reminds me, of course, of the, the koan about uh, Kasyapa, the Buddha himself, his final sermon to determine his successor, as you may recall, was to hold up a flower and say nothing. What could you say? It's, it's all there. And Kasyapa smiled to indicate that he got, he got it, and so he became the successor, because he recognized the whole universe, himself included, in this single stem of a flower. Or the, uh, you may recall the koan where the blade of grass was the temple. That's the only temple we need, just a blade of grass. Mm -hmm. Or a grain of sand. The whole universe is there. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when I studied uh, Eastern art back in college when I first met Roshi Kennedy. Uh, I was doing a paper on, on the Yuan dynasty and th there was this, really the, the etching of a, a bamboo leaf you're talking about a bamboo stem, you know, a flute, but this was the leaf and a single leaf and you just saw how it was powerfully and, and spontaneously enunciated and then f went off into nothingness. You know, it just drifted off, you know, the line just drifted off. So the absolute and the relative, you know, feeding each other. It's our life again too. Um, that's what calligraphy is, if you think about it. You're learning how to do calligraphy, and it it's, comes right from the gut. You can just do it, and you know vanishes as soon as you do it, and comes from, from that nothingness as well. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you can think of other, the other you know, chants. You know, the, uh, the Tibetan chant, you know, was, it's, 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 it is the, uh, the background music of the Big Bang. It's, it's the cosmic music. You know, it's, uh, or you know, even our even just chant that we use, uh, or there any, any music really uh, of any depth. Think of the Gregorian chant that I chanted thousands and thousands and thousands of hours. You know, when I was a monk. You know, that tries to uh, condense. You know, into uh, just the, a few notes, a few modulations. You know, the whole the whole of reality really. In fact, as this goes on to say. As a player, you put all of life's force, all of that intensity, I'm just talking about, all of life's force into the sound of one note. Because it is all of life's one note. I think of uh, the last koan in the Mamonkan where you have uh, someone ask, what's the way? And the monk just takes his staff and draws a line in the air and says, that's the way. Right here, right there, you know, everything is there, you know, visually in that. Well, audio, on the audio, uh, it's in one note, hmm? always concentrated in one note. Hmm? Um, the uh, you think of the, the uh, Avalokiteshvara, the, you know, the Bodhisattva of compassion is described in the koan as having, you know, uh, a thousand arms and a thousand eyes. You know, you just become all eye and all. Uh, and Buddha, you know, Buddhism says, you know, you hear with your eye and you see with your ear. I mean, it just becomes one enormous perception, one enormous awareness, consciousness, symbolized in this way. The Desert Fathers used to speak about just sitting in their cell and becoming one big eye. It sounds like a horror movie, but it's, but it's not. It's, it's just a bit pure, pure awareness. Hmm? Um, and that's what happens here. So the hearer and the heard are one. There's no subject object anymore. It's just non-duality. It's just the reality. And so the hearing, the hearer and the heard, you know, it's all one, all one reality. And you know what? Surprisingly enough, good old Aristotle, good old reasonable reasoning Aristotle said the same thing. He said that what's heard uh, and the act of hearing are the same thing. It's all one all one reality in that actual hearing. The hearer and the heard are one. So if you can figure it out even on that level, you should be able to experience it. Um, so into, into the sound of one note. And this transcends life and death. Absolutely. 
If all reality is there, you're beyond life and death. So if you are that one note, you're beyond life and death. And it says, with the tangible, you participate in the intangible. That's just what we're saying. The absolute and the relative come back, right? Feeding each other in and out. With the visible, you go into the invisible, it says. Mm -hmm. Exactly, as I was just describing. Mm -hmm. So it says this, this music is an extreme example of that. Mm -hmm. So when you go into this rarefied world, it says, <laughs> where nothing is there, <laughs> nothing, which means, of course, everything. That is where you live limitlessly. Because you can be fully there and you got it. And you're living limitlessly. Hmm? I thought of the koan uh, in the uh, Blue Cliff record uh, about, you know, there's the power of the sound. In the 85th case is the hermit of Tung Feng makes a tiger's roar. So a monk came to the place of the hermit and asked, if you suddenly encountered a tiger here, what then? And the hermit made a tiger's roar. The hermit was the tiger, of course. The monk then made a gesture of fright. And the hermit laughed. I'm having fun with this. But, you know, we are the tiger, we're the dragon, we're the tiger's roar. And... Uh, you know, the louder it is, you know, the more silent it is. The more silent it is, the louder it is. And it's you. It's just you. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the pointer, the introduction says, uh, it's touching iron to turn it into gold and gold and turning it into iron. That's the absolute and relative, you know, coming back and forth into each other again. Mm -hmm. And then this thing too is fascinating. To release a light from one's forehead that, that shines through the four quarters. This is the adamantine diamond eye of patch-robed monks. Hmm? Uh, you no, know, my yoga teacher you know, pointed out that there are actually the th double third eye, the third eye in the forehead, the third in the ajna, and one is higher, one is lower clairvoyance, and the higher one has a beam of light just like they're describing here. Hmm? That's where you get the unicorn, by the way. That's what the unicorn symbolizes, hmm? that light. So it's like lightning coming in. So it's lightning, the roar is like thunder as well, like the roar of thunder. Uh, you know, in Tibetan Buddhism, you have the dorj, you know, which is that scepter kind of thing, uh, which is diamond, adamantine. Uh, and it's also thunderbolt, lightning, that pure diamond ex experience of the pure light and pure sound coming at once. You know. It's really quite fascinating. Um, in the book of Revelation, there's a description of an angel with legs of fire who stands one leg on the sea and one leg on the land. And when he speaks, it's like a lion's roar. And when he spoke, the thunder sounded, seven thunders. Who knows, maybe the chakras. But the thunder, thunder is right there too. Hmm? Hmm. Um, I it couldn't help thinking of as well of uh, very similar passages in uh, St. John of the Cross, his spiritual canticle. Hmm? He speaks about uh, the silent music, which is the union with reality, silent music, again, paradox. But the deeper the music is, the richer it is, the more silent it is. So he says, creatures will be for the soul a harmonious symphony of sublime music, surpassing all concerts and all melodies of the world. He calls this music silent because it is tranquil and quiet knowledge with no sound of a voice. Thus there is in it the sweetness of music and the quietude of silence at the same time. She also calls it the sounding solitude. So this is the Ryan's roar. The more solitary and silent it is, you get a roar there, the sounding solitude. It's almost the same as silent music. 
So you can, when your faculties are alone and empty of all natural forms and apprehensions, their usual egoic way of, of perceiving, they can receive in a most sonorous way the spiritual sound of the excellence of God, the absolute, and himself and in his creatures. And he quotes the apocalypse here. It says in chapter 14 where it says, the voice, I've heard in heaven, is the voice of many harpists playing on their harps. You know? So that's what we are, we're harps, you know, played by, played by the, um, by the universe, you know, the spirit, if you will. Um, and the same description says it's the sound of many waters and the sound of thunder. Right there again. Coming back to that, coming back to that imagery. Hmm? Um, you know, and of course, as I say, we and we we ourselves are the are the uh, are the um, flute. You know, it's often used even in the West. We use that image, like we're the hollow flute. If we're hollow enough, the sound can go through. You know, the reality can be, the music can be played on us, but we have to be hollow and empty. Hmm? Um, and the uh, the other thing I think of the of the uh, of the uh, in the Jewish tradition, the shofar, you know, that's very much just like a didgeridoo or like a, a, like a, like one of these shakuhachi flutes, you know. Uh, if you ever heard one, you're not going to forget it. You know, a powerful sound going through the ram's horn is what it is. You know, um, at the uh, uh, at the end of morning prayer every day in the monastery, and I something I still do. I use Psalm 150, the very last psalm, and uh, I recite it in Hebrew. And the uh, and that one of the last verses is you know the sono tube in Latin, the, the sound of the trumpet, the sound of the shofar, uh, tekak shofar. Uh, and what's fascinating about it is that the word for the sound, for the thrust, for the blow, tekak, uh, is used for that, but it's also a word that means a thrust of a sword. So that's what it's like. It penetrates you like a sword, that powerful sound, you know. And that's what happens, you know, when you're slain by and given life. And there we're right back to John of the Cross. He uses those same images, St. Teresa of Avila. Jesus just uses the same thing, that this experience is like a sword, you know, which pierces you and slays you, but gives you life at the same time. And Zen often talks in that language about being slain and given life by the very same thrust of enlightenment and awareness. Hmm? So you see how all these wonderful traditions, you know, interpenetrate in their, in their imagery uh, and in their, their insight. Hmm? Uh, the one thing that, that, that I read an article on Shakuhachi, you know, to get learn more about this and some fascinating things. Apparently you can find the Shakuhachi music in Jurassic Park. I dare you. Uh, and also it was used apparently on January 1st, 2000 for the new millennium. This Shakuhachi music was played on the wings of the Sydney Opera House at dawn. Wow, I can just imagine what that was like. The only thing that put me off a little bit is that shakuhachi players often wear wicker baskets over their head to say, you know, so not to be distracted, you know, by sights and sounds around them. It reminds me when I was a monk, you know, we wore cowls, you know, to focus, you know, keep ourselves focused. But at most solemn times, for example, during the daily mass, the liturgy, we would actually pull them all the way up down over our eyes. And I say that that's not, I, I think I have a right because I did it myself to say I'm, I'm a little wary of that. Because the, inf, because, the, because the relative and the absolute should, should you know, be bouncing off right back and forth from each other and you shouldn't be distracted by anything. But okay. there's an ancient wisdom there in both, so I, okay. But, uh, but I think uh, we don't need that. Hmm? Uh, but at least you'll know who they are if you see anybody with a wicker basket over their head in the street, you know, uh, playing. Yeah, he did not. The, this, this artist did not wear one when he was playing the shakuhachi. Huh? Have you seen that? N not that, not the wicker basket. The wicker baskets are like a wide. Distance. They are. They're very, very wide and big, and they come down over, down, down to your chin. Over the head. Yes. Play, well, it, down, down through here. Mm -hmm. Oh, I thought that they were more like. No, they're not like a Chinese hat, no. So anyway, I think 
there's a lot of stuff there for us to, to absorb and to, to realize that, you know, every sound, you know, the call of a goose in the sky, you know, every stem of a flower, you know, is a lion's roar sounding in the silence and slaying us, you know, and transforming us, you know, we become one with it and one with everything at the same time. So be attentive. <laughs>